we're mostly flying blind through life because love is not taught to us. If we all understood the power of love and the power of loss of love on our mental health and our physical health, we would actually thrive. Dr. Molly, welcome to Women of Impact Girl. Thank you so much for having me. I've been dying for you to come on the show because I heard that while you were actually teaching at Stanford, you started to look into the importance of health and you found that love was just as freaking important as thirst and hunger. Yeah, I mean, connection is vital for longevity, vital for long-term health and happiness. It's literally the greatest factor we know in long-term health and happiness. But when I was growing up, I was raised very Christian and I was raised with this idea of like unconditional love and I had two really amazing great parents. So I was a bit like sheltered, had this Disney view of love. I was like, love is just this beautiful thing. And then I got into the real world when I grew up and I realized that, whoa, 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 love is not always a Disney movie. In fact, there's a polarity to love that's almost a double-edged sword because like there's the sex drive, right? There's the romantic love drive, there's the attachment, there's social connection, familial bonds. And of every facet of love, there's the benefits and the risks and there's the sort of upside and the downside. So like the upside of the sex drive is we have pleasure, we have desire. The downside of the sex drive is like, you know, if you, if you experience sexual trauma or let's say you go through menopause and you no longer have estrogen, right? You may have a tank, tank sex, sex drive. Or with romantic love, you get this beautiful addictive experience, right? You're like high on life. I and mean, a lot of people get engaged while they're in romantic love. Mm. But romantic love is like a powerful high. And the loss of romantic love, right? Can, like a bad breakup can deeply affect your health and it can cause depression, can cause literal, it can be a form of you know traumatic experience for people to go through. And then stalking and harassment can result from love. Domestic abuse, believe it or not, can result from falling in love with somebody who's an abusive partner. And then there's attachment, right? So attachment is like so important for longevity because when we have healthy attachment, healthy secure attachment, it creates a safe haven for us to return to. It creates such a deep bond that we can better raise children. It creates um, familial bonds, which can enable us to have, to have better longevity. But if you get divorced, you get really deep pain, pain. A lot of people go through real pain with divorce. It's considered an adverse childhood experience. It's considered one of the most stressful things a, per a person can experience and go through. Familial bonds are important because literally they're tied to longevity. So if you lose a parent but you have siblings, you still have connectivity. You still have you know, a family that can take care of you. But a lot of people have broken families. A lot of people have, have families that, you know, let's say they had a parent that got divorced. So they're, you know, they're maybe co-parenting and raising children in two different households, which can cause stress. But divorce and, and even the death of a partner can cause really, or death of a parent can cause severe grief. And I've seen people go through serious health challenges after they lost a parent. And then there's social bonds, right? Which I'm like highly, highly encouraging people to create deep social networks of lots of friends because Having lots of friends can make you feel safe in different cities when you travel and visit. It can make you feel supported when, let's say, maybe you're having a family conflict, which one of my friends came, came to me for last week. And But the downside of social bonding is that if you make a mistake in your friend group, like one of my friends did, you can become ostracized. And so love is powerful, right? Because when it's good, it makes our life enriched. It makes our life heavenly and happy and filled with more information, more resources, you know, more sexuality more comfort, more safety, more trust, and more love, more protection. And even feeling like someone will, will take care of you and protect you if you're being attacked. Like I had someone um, try to extort me once and I had my family pull out their lawyers and I had so many friends, you know, pull out their, their connections and I was able to like move through that situation with grace because I had so much support. But not everybody has that, right? So like, to me, love should be taught in schools. Love should be part of our education. And yet we're mostly flying blind through life because love is not taught to us. We're kind of taught, I mean, I was taught about love through my religion growing up, but I really feel like if we all understood the power of love and the power of loss of love on our mental health and our physical health, we would actually thrive. We'd thrive more because we'd be, able, we'd be equipped with the knowledge we would need to survive in this crazy and chaotic world. But as I think we've all noticed that like, you know, we went through this major social experiment of social isolation during the pandemic. And that was a really great example of how disconnection can cause serious diseases of despair. We have more, more suicidality, more homicides, 
And I think isolation has done a lot of damage to our society. And we really need to re-examine social connectivity in the context of medicine and psychology if we want to transform the health of our country. Holy <laughs> fuck. Dude, holy fuck. Right? Like, you just blew my mind. I've never heard of love being dissected the way you just did and put so beautiful words to it. And it explains everything. It explains everything. The thing that you have said before that I heard that was so profound coming with the word with love mm -hmm. is the loneliness piece. Because when you're looking for love, when you're searching for love, when you have love, you've just laid out all these ways that can really impact you. And now I think the opposite, right? If you're feeling lonely, mm -hmm. what do you do? How that knock on effect yeah. of how you can spiral and how it really impacts your health. The reason why this is so important, girl, is the, the constant denominator that every time someone recognizes me, they say I've saved their lives because of relationship yes. episodes. All yeah. the episodes that I've done on here about, I'm like, oh, they must be talking about something. And it always goes back to relationships. Yeah. There's a reason. But I didn't expect it to be the thing that yeah. people said, I've saved their lives over. Yeah. So when I heard you and when I heard your connection between love and the, the severe impact of how we feel and then how long we live was so mind blowing that I would love for you to break down the word loneliness, what sure. that actually means. Because I'm in the place right now, the people are listening they're looking for a solution. I know. And I never want to be like, take this pill, right? I've, Definitely I've, not. I've suffered from health issues. The yeah. last thing you do is just take a pill. Yeah. But the exploration of what you're saying is so powerful. Yeah, let's talk about loneliness. Okay, so loneliness, we evolved because in primitive times, it would have been unsafe for you to be at the outskirts of your community because you would be easily attacked by neighboring tribes, easily attacked by animals. Like people lived on the savanna in tribes. So like if you were on the outskirts, you were at risk. So we literally evolved this as a pain signal. It's like a hunger or a pain signal. And it's like, it's supposed to send you and reconnect you to those you love. But what happens if people don't have a tribe? Now this is the issue, right? Now you're alone. Now you're having this painful experience of feeling alone and you're not connected, you're disconnected. And like, if you think about the body, like you can't take an organ out of the body for very long. If it's not connected, it won't survive. Mm. It needs flow, it needs energy, or it needs to feel connected and plugged in. Similar to like, you know, if you cut the power of a house, the, the freezer's gonna melt, like stuff's gonna break, right? So like, we need this, we, we literally, when we're plugged in to a community, there's energy flow, there's shared information, there's shared resources, there's shared support. I've had friends that have taken off the ledge of suicide and they were like, you, because you were there for me, I'm still here today. Like that is real life, you know? And I, I've really valued um, building community over like the last, you know, 20 years of my life, but really in the last 10 years in particular, when I moved out of my hometown and I moved to the Bay Area and I like built a whole network of new friends. I, I chose the Bay Area because I had a, a small community there from Burning Man. Mm. I'd gone to Burning Man with one friend and I left with 50. And that was really special. I mean, like Burning Man is a really special place because you really make deep bonds with people. One of the most interesting things is if you meet people in a context that feels slightly dangerous, which is actually Burning Man feels kind of like you're exposed to the elements. It feels dangerous. It's not dangerous. But it's not dangerous unless you do stupid things. But generally speaking, Burning Man's pretty safe. But it feels because you're exposed to the elements. There's like this weird element of uncertainty and danger. So you get these deeper social bonds. Mm. It's really interesting. And what's mm. what's what I find really fascinating is like, you know, if you um, have one friend, you can have ten friends. And so I had if you especially if you make friends with like the one friend who's social. You can ask them, hey, will you introduce me to more people? I could use more help making friends. Like that's one of my biggest hacks to making friends, especially if you're in a new city. Like meet a few people and then ask them to introduce them you to their networks. That's how I made like literally five different friend groups in Austin in six months. Wow. It was like I found a few people that were highly socially networked and I was like, I wanna meet you, I wanna meet your friends. I wanna like build community. I want to organize dinners. Like I, I, I instigate a lot of social things because I find that if I don't, then I can become disconnected from just working too much. But also- Do you have a hack, sorry, I just yeah. thought of it, that when you're in those moments of feeling disconnected, because most people disconnect more when you I feel know. disconnected. I know, I used to be like this. 
in my 20s, yeah. I used to isolate myself when I was stressed because I was like, I don't want to be a burden on anyone. Yeah, you and know? also you don't want to go out. It's like you, you feel like maybe you have to put on a face so you, you isolate more, which yeah. then leads into more isolation. So there's this thing called um, maladaptive social cognition. And it's a weird term for when you become lonely and isolated, you become hypercritical to any social cues that could be perceived as negative. And so if you go out and you have like a negative experience, you'll be like, it may not be that big of a deal, but you're gonna feel like it's a really big deal because your body is sensitized to, I don't know if I feel good about this, you know? Like your body becomes, weirdly, lo loneliness and perceived social isolation comes with the wrong perceptions of reality. It's so, It super sucks, but you have to accept that your brain is misinterpreting signals. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that I just typically will do is like, if I feel like I offend someone or I feel like I like, you know, said something wrong, I'll just like try to repair things immediately and be like, hey, I think I screwed up, you know? Hey, I think something went wrong. And um, so you have to just accept that your brain is gonna kind of some, potentially lie to you a little bit. And I've also seen this happen in people who've had any experience with social um, disconnection or social, tra like any sort of trauma mm -hmm. in a social situation. Maybe they had a fight with someone, got ostracized. They now perceive all social situations as dangerous when really like just because you have one bad experience with a social you know relationship doesn't mean that all social relationships are bad like i recently went on a date with a guy who had broken up with someone two weeks prior and like i was i'd only met the girl twice but she went and started spreading rumors about me and i was like wow that's really painful because i don't even know you when people lose like something that they love like they can become a little bit crazy and they will say things and so i experienced a lot of pain from this person saying things about me that just weren't true. And I was like, and then I was perceiving everyone was against me and it wasn't true. And so I, I spoke to my friends, I'm like, here's what happened, what do I do? And they're like, well, first of all, like that's crazy that she said those things about you. And second of all, we love you, we know you, you are wonderful. Like we wouldn't be friends with you if we didn't think you were the best. And I was like, oh my God, thank you so much mm -hmm. for making me feel good. Cause I was really questioning my reality because I'd never felt this way before. I never had this happen to me before where someone, said, you know, I've never had rumors spread about me that were negative. And I'm very fortunate, thank, thank God. But like, there's a first time for everything. But this is the challenge of social connectivity is you do, the world is inherently run by our biology, whether we realize it or not. Like our biology is actually running the show of a lot of the world. So like, you know, at the end of the day, like, there, there's like, there's a lot of competition going on, right? There's a competition for mates, there's a competition for resources. And there's, and there's like, and we, we, we have this like, we put on a face that the world is this like beautiful, safe, wonderful thing. It can be really risky and, and dangerous. And we have to accept that like, there is some risk in going out into the world and putting yourself out there. But rec like when you can build your, your when you can build a, a, a world around you of people that you do trust and you, they do know you and they do love you and have that core network of people that maybe 20, 10 to 20 people who are your mm -hmm. truest friends, who are your biggest allies, who know you deeply and who have your back no matter what, that's way more valuable than having hundreds of acquaintances mm. is what I've learned. Mm. Is like really cultivating those deep relationships where like when you know you have a deep friendship is when you can go to someone when you have your worst day, when things are absolutely at their worst. And they're and, and then your friends will tell you the truth of like what do they perceive, what are, what's going on. Um, but to build those deep relationships, you have to figure out how to create them in the first place, right? So like, I joined a social, I joined a gym that was a social club. And I was like, this is cool. I can make friends at my gym. And I became better friends with one of my neighbors who introduced me to other people. And, and I became friends with other, other neighbors. Like proximity is one of the biggest factors of friendships and relationships, romantic or platonic. So really trying to find people who live nearby you that are convenient, that are located near where you live to actually, that, that's what's gonna lead to like these deeper friendships, deeper relationships. But also don't forget about the old friends, you know, maintaining contact, regularly remember, like if someone comes to your mind, text them, be like, hey, we should catch up. And then I actually keep a list of a follow-up list of like people who say, hey, I really wanna chat with you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any time right now because I'm launching a book, but I'm like, I have these people on my follow-up list so that I cannot forget about them. Because like, if you, if you forget to follow up with people, you never know if like somebody really needs you. That was such an amazing breakdown of loneliness and then how to really counteract it because when you're in these moments you and you feel lost, yeah. I'm always like, what are they gonna go to or what do you go to? And for me, 
I just want to know the truth. Yeah. So when I start to feel lonely, when I start to feel isolated, I just know thyself. So I know that I'm going to retreat, which I know ends up not leading anywhere good. So now in exactly what you just broke down, it's like you have to be deliberate. Yeah. You have to reach out to these people. It's not going to happen by accident. Yeah. And it's hard, especially if you're insecure or you're worried about rejection, to reach out to that one friend to say, hey, do you mind introduce me? Because there's that possibility of being rejected. Yeah. Um, that then makes you feel worse about yourself, which then makes you not do it in the first place. Well, it's kind of like everything in life is dating. I've discovered fundraising is like dating, even though not like, not, and I don't mean by having sex with any means. I mean like the process of dating of like, do they like me? Do they not like me? Mm-hmm. Like finding a job is like that, getting hired, getting a book deal is like a sorority rush. Mm-hmm. You know, like so much of life feels like dating in a weird way. So you have to get okay with rejection. You have to be okay with like, you know, um, with people not always saying yes. And also like one of the things that I find that that was the greatest hack for my social life was there was a day where I realized that almost everybody's socially awkward under the surface and that I could choose to just not be awkward. And or if I am awkward, who cares? Someone once said, that they thought that I was socially awkward. I'm like, great, guess what? I don't care. They I feel said to- that to your face? No, they said it behind my back. And um, <laughs> well. it's funny because like, whenever people say, oh my God, I've heard about you. I'm like, well, what, what did you hear? You know, like, I'm like, what did you hear? Mm-hmm. And like, generally speaking, most of the time it's really positive stuff. But sometimes I get into negative and I'm like, wow, I'm so glad that someone told me that because we often don't get to hear what people really believe mm-hmm. unless we hear it from someone else. And like, I think it's, um. I think it's actually really important to try to get unbiased or biased or whatever feedback you can from as many people as you can, but also really only take the opinions of people that you really respect. Like if you respect and really know someone and they tell you, hey, here's what I'm noticing, that's worth taking in. But don't take advice from people who like you don't really know and like maybe don't know you at all, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's really really hard to develop a bit of a thick skin because the world feels scary and you can feel disconnected in this world, but building a social community and a social network is like anything else that requires effort. Just like building a strong long-term relationship, just like, you know, getting up the nerve to talk to your partner about something that really, like you're really upset about. Like I was, I, I've, you know, I've been dating and like things come up during dating that like, you're just like, what did they really do that? And you bring it up and you're like, Hey, so when you said this, it made me feel this way. And I don't know how it made you feel, but like, that's what's going on for me. Like nonviolent communication is so valuable. Imago therapy, have you heard about this? No. Okay, Harville Hendricks and his wife developed this therapy. It's called, it's like basically mirroring, empathizing and validating another person in, a, in, in any situation. So it's like, if you're in a conflict with someone, one of the biggest problems is that they don't feel like you see their opinion and they don't see your perspective and they, they just don't see you. And so mirroring back and echoing back the things that they said can make them feel heard and then validating what they said. You know what? Like, I understand that this thing upset you and you have every right to feel this way. And then empathizing. You know what? If I had had that experience, it would make me feel this way. I understand where you're coming from. Like I had all these students last summer summarize books for me. And I basically got a masterclass on like relationship and conflict resolution on the science of love, on the effects of dopamine in the body. Like I had them study all these, I didn't have time to read all these books. So Mm -hmm. I had all these students that were just writing me book reports. And it was awesome because I was like going through, at the end of the summer, I was going through everything. And I was like, oh my God, if everybody had this knowledge, we'd all be so much smarter about how we interact with people. And yet it's, it's one thing to know and it's another thing to do, you know? Like there's often, oftentimes we, we don't really fully put ourselves in the shoes of other people. And we don't, we often will judge people by how they treat us in the moment without really asking, well, why is that person acting this way in the first place? You know? Okay, so on that note, you said earlier, I didn't want to interrupt you, but this is so perfect. Where you said, um, when people have heartbreak, they act, act, act crazy. Oh, they can I didn't be want crazy. To, I didn't want to pause, but why? Because here's the thing. To your point of like understanding oh, someone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, no, let's talk right? about this. It's like if someone acts crazy. Have you heard of the terms mate guarding or mate poaching? No. All right. So I'm pretty sure that what happened was she thought I was mate poaching, which I was under the impression that these two had broken up, right? Oh. I was like, I, he told me we broke up. Oh. And he was, he was on a date when he told me this. Yeah. And I invited him and his friends to a party. And because I wanted to be friends with this crew because they were cool guys. And all the girls left and then the guy stayed and then the guy goes to me, he's like, I don't really know if I like this girl. And also I you obviously noticed I broke up with, you know, you know who. And I was like, yeah, I was wondering where you were with another date. 
And anyway, he starts putting the moves on me. And I'm like, well, you know, it's been a few weeks since they've broken up. And it was like two weeks later when he and I went on a date. And I was like, I didn't feel like I was mate poaching. I was like, he made a decision to break up with this person that must have been amicable. And I didn't know that they were still sleeping together because he didn't tell me that. Mm. So now there's a complication here, right? So there's this person who's still sleeping with his ex who tells me that they're broken up. Mm. And she's like, this woman's mate, what she perceived, her nervous system was like, she is trying to poach my partner. So I'm gonna guard this guy. Uh How am I gonna guard this guy? I'm going to spread rumors about this girl because she's new in town. I'm gonna make sure that everyone thinks that she is shady. One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? what? We put time, effort, and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. And I was like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. I did not. I, and I actually backed away from this whole situation because I was like, she did a good, I mean, she effectively accomplished what she was trying to do. Mm-hmm. But in the process, I had to tell her, I'm like, look, like, um, potential investor brought this to me. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term defamation of character, but like, technically, like, that's what you were doing. And so... Just so you know, like for your own safety, like in, in security of your career, you should know that people sue people for this, you know? And I have no intention of taking you to court, but I want you to know that like this actually potentially affected my professional life. And that was when I realized that love <laughs> and dating, you know, is a challenging, challenging world, you know? Like I, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that like cares enough, to, like if a woman really wants someone, like I'm not gonna go and like fight over a guy. Mm. I just don't care. Like I'm, I'm like, there's billions of people in the world. But I'd never experienced the experience of someone who had directly attacked me for dating someone. Like I've never experienced that in my entire life. And I realized that there was a deep programming under the surface where she really desperately wanted to be with this person. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I understood. And I was like, wow, if she's willing to go to that length to get him back, then like she can have him, like go for it. Like that's, if that's what you want, like I'm not gonna fight, I'm not gonna play this game. But I also had been studying love and mm-hmm. I understood mm-hmm. I understood. I was like, you know what? Like, I get where she's coming from. If that's and, and arguably, like, according to evolutionary biology, like, that was her. That was her choice to make. You know, like, in some ways, I kind of like accepted it. So that's what I was going to say. In everything you just explained, is it that then, in that situation, she is in love? Then comes in the fear or the threat. And so, based on what you said about loneliness, about how much that can really negatively impact, the fear came in. I didn't want to be lonely, so she acted out of character in order to say, "quote unquote," safe in her relationship. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, okay, so wow, that was really enlightening. Um, I've never thought about it like I that. I know. And it explains so much of, of dating today, these days yes. in society, right? Like when people get broken up with, I mean, I've had a bad breakup before and I remember it being like devastating for my nervous system. I mean, I was, I wasn't, I, I don't think I would just define myself as clinically depressed, but I certainly was not happy. <laughs> okay, so, so take me through you that. Know? Like what is then happening where you start to feel like I'm broken, oh my God, Well, let's get real about what love feels like. But intense romantic love in the early phases, especially in the first few months, feels like you are on drugs, right? It it literally is like being on MDMA Mm. all the time. So you probably shouldn't make serious life decisions while you're high. Which is, I, I literally had some friends. I love you to say that matter of fact. I mean, yeah. I had a friend who got engaged and and luckily, not luckily, not formally married, but got engaged within three months of dating someone. And I was like, oh God, no, mm. honey, no, you just can't. And I could see them on video and I was like, you guys are high right now. Mm. You can't get married. Fortunately, they didn't do a legal marriage, but they had done like a kind of burner marriage. And I was like, okay, do people not realize that they are high while they're in love? Like you wait till after that phase is over to make the big decisions to settle down with someone because you got to learn how they fight. You got to learn how they handle conflict. You got to learn what their family's like. Like there's so many things you need to, you need to figure out if you have the same financial, you know, status and resources. You need to figure out, do you need a prenup or not? Like you need to figure out like, do they fit within your life or not? Like we, we have this idea about love in our society that is so based on like, like, 
when people like people like make a lot of decisions while they're on lo in love. But when you break up with someone, if you're if you've been on, a, if you, it's, it feels like you're going through withdrawal. Like it feels like you're literally going through withdrawal. And so, you know, this is way, this is why people make these crazy, people do crazy things when they've gotten broken up with. In fact, do you mind breaking down what um, is actually happening in your body with, with yeah. withdrawal? Because I really love this This Well, let's connection. talk about what romantic love is doing. So you get dopamine, right? Okay, yep. Dopamine makes this person highly significant, very, very important, very meaningful. Everything they say is like the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. And it's the most interesting thing you've ever that you've heard them say, because you've never heard every story they've had before. Fast forward, long-term relationship, you've heard every story they've said, you know, 15 times. So one of the things that you should be doing when you're evaluating a partner is how many times am I comfortable with their life stories? Do I want to keep hearing these stories over and over again? Is this like this, do I like the way that they describe their life? Because you're going to have to hear their life stories over and over and over again. So romantic love and dopamine is like, dopamine is like the drug, drug of desire. So you're very turned on by them. You're very sexually aroused by them. And you basically like want, you want to be around them because it feels so good. And then there's serotonin. Fair serotonin is this feeling of like a warm hug and you're connected and they feel like home. They feel like warm and fuzzy. And then oxytocin is this like, I feel safe with you. I can trust you. You know, we often will develop a certain amount of uh, trust that's not based on reality early in romantic love mm. because we feel the oxytocin, especially after lots of orgasms. So orgasms release oxytocin and oxytocin makes you feel safety, trust and bonded to a person, which is why if you fall in love with someone after, you know, having lots of sex, like a lot, I've noticed this before where people were dating, they weren't really totally in love with them, but they were having lots of sex, but they were deeply attached to them. Mm. So sometimes if you like don't really cultivate the, the deeper love, you can become attached just through having sex with someone a lot. And that's the oxytocin at play. And that's why they say you should wait to have sex. You really probably should, you know, it's hard because like, I've definitely had relationships where I waited a few months. I've definitely had relationships where I didn't wait. But I think that generally speaking, waiting a little bit of time to get just get to know them and just like, do you really like this person? So knowing that, how long do you typically wait? Like, let's say, because if you just you trust your feelings, even though your feelings can mislead you sometimes in this situation. So even if it feels like it's true love, the love of my life, mm -hmm. if people are listening, I think it's beautiful to say, hey, wait. I know obviously you can't necessarily give a locked number, but like, is it at least six months? Is it at least a year? I is mean, it at least four years? The about, here's the thing you need to realize about love is that it's a motivational force that literally drives people together to create proximity and to share information and resources. And if you're in a romantic love situation, your body, you know, emotional intimacy usually, usually leads to physical intimacy. Mm. And there's a reason for that. Your body and your biological imperative is trying to get you to reproduce, whether you want to child or not. Like, this is why lots of babies occur from just people having sex, because like the people have sex, but they don't always think about children. But it happens because your body is trying to trick you into having babies all, all times. That's why in that <laughs> moment you hear a lot of people is just like, well, it was in the moment. Yeah. So I think if we understood our neurobiology mm. and we understood, OK, my body is trying to get me to have a baby right now. If I don't want a baby with this person, I should probably be using a condom. I should probably be not like, I should probably be having a conversation with this person. What would happen if we got pregnant? Like you should have conversations with people about these things if you can, if you can take off the hormones, which is hard to do if you're having lots of sex with the person. Mm -hmm. I just think a lot of people are searching, single people are searching for deeper connection. You know, like this is a fact, like I, Helen Fisher is one of my advisors and she's studying match.com data sets. And she's like, people don't want as much casual sex. They want real relationships. They want real depth. So it's like, what do you want? Do you mm -hmm. want a fling or do you want? And by the way, if you want a fling, I'm not going to stop you. Like people deserve to have a sexual experience if they want. But what do you really want? You know, do you want a long term relationship? Do you want a serious relationship? Do you want a long term? Do you want marriage? Do you want kids? Do you not want kids? Like I fell in love with a man once who didn't want children that broke us up. Mm -hmm. It was really challenging. And I didn't listen to his statements early on in the relationship, which was I'm not going to have children. And I just was like, oh, but, but one of my girlfriends said, well, that's what they all say. But then they fall in love with you. And then it's just like, then they'll eventually give in. I was totally misguided by this individual. And I mean, don't get me wrong, wonderful human, but not everybody's going to say yes to having kids. And nor should you trick someone. I, I wasn't going to do that either. So I just walked away. And, so, you know, it's funny because um, I, th I think like 
I've learned a lot through dating in my 30s. I didn't date a lot in my 20s because I was in medical school and college and I was so focused on career that I just didn't prioritize dating. So I got a little bit stunted in my 30s and so I started dating in my 30s and I had to learn from trial and error. But it's funny because I'm 38 now and I can genuinely say like I know what I want in my life. I don't. I think a lot of what we do in dating is we figure out what we want. So it's hard to do that without experience. So sometimes mm. you just need to tell the person like, hey, I'm figuring out what I want. I'm not completely sure, but they should know that because like if you don't, t if you tell someone you know what you want and you don't, then you're not being fully open and honest, you know? Oh my God. So what I love about this is I go, I love all the like, as you can tell, I geek out on the brain science and the yeah. chemicals and all that because then I go, how do I actually do that in my life? Like yeah. know thyself, hear what you're saying and then go, if this is true, how do I make sure I don't trick myself into making a decision if what you're saying, like, I mean, it makes complete sense. So even as you were talking, I was thinking like, and I actually did this with Tom because I was so attracted to him. Yeah. So if people that don't know, this is my husband of 20 years, but when we first started dating, I was so attracted to him that by the time he asked me out on the first date, I was like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm just gonna oh like fall God. in love with yes. him. And I was like so giddy that I didn't shave my legs on purpose. <laughs> Because I knew, I've done this. right? I've because done you this. know, the oxytocin is going to like convince me that oh my god, yeah. just, just go to bed with him, Lisa. You know yeah. you want to, and so I like like hacked it in the sense by yeah. going, well, if you don't shave your legs, no matter how into him you are, you know you're not going to get naked. <laughs> I've done the same thing with like bikini waxes, and I'm like, I am not getting a bikini wax for months. I'm not doing it because I'm not having sex right now. And it's funny how well it works, you know? Yeah. Like, because you're just like, you're not thinking about it as much, you know? It's just like, okay, I'm like, I'm hands off. But also telling a person like, hey, I really want to take things slow. But even that, you know, even it's challenging. that, it is because not only is it challenging for you, but like, in all honesty, I did tell Tom, he still tried it on. Yeah. So he was like, no, I don't sleep with women on the first date. By the time that dinner was over, it's like, it starts to be like, yeah you know because you're because you're, you're, you're emotional bonding. intimacy yeah. the physical intimacy it's natural exactly he invites me back to his place he reads me poetry he oh wrote. my god so of course i'm just like falling head over heels during this day so in that moment i'm like thank god i didn't shave my legs <laughs> there you go i mean it, it can be really hard to like when you when you feel these hormones you feel this intense experience with someone it can be really hard to, to like turn that off, especially mm -hmm. for men, by the way. Like we don't, we don't realize, like we totally don't realize what men are going through. And it's so funny to me because I once told this story on Aubrey Marcus's podcast and I've gotten just, I've literally gotten like ripped to shreds by this guy, this, this like very masculine influencer who basically trolls for a living, made a video about me, basically just saying that I was lying about my experience. But I actually once at my job, we were doing um, custom compounded hormones and nutraceuticals. Custom, what was it? Compounded hormones and nutraceuticals, like very personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. It was like very Silicon Valley. And um, I'm like working at this office and I sit down on this chair and I'm like, wow, this chair is like really slippery. Why? That's weird. Maybe it has polish on it. And so I'm getting to the work at the computer and I'm like, weird. I'm like feeling kind of weird and I'm like kind of flushed. And, and I was like, it, this is over the course of like an eight hour work day. I didn't really explain that in the first Aubrey Marcus video because it was like a 30 second story that I told. Right. But just to clarify, because this person made a video about me and you can guys go watch it. He, <laughs> this guy like literally talks about testosterone all day, but somehow has missed the sort of memo that like women use testosterone as well for libido. So I had never taken a, a women's or men's amount of testosterone for libido before. And I'm here I am at work sitting on this chair and it's been a few hours and this stuff is cooked in. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, what is going on? Why am I looking at my coworkers? Like, why am I attracted to them? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I have not had any feelings for these coworkers. I don't even like, I'm like, my boss is like, he's weird. Like, no. And I go to the bathroom and I literally remember putting my arms, this is like four hours into the day, right? I'm putting my arms on the table and I'm like, what is wrong with me? And I'm like, wait. Did I get cream on my arm? Did my coworker sit on that chair before I sat down? Testosterone cream. It was testosterone cream and it was not a minor amount. It was like a pretty, I mean, he did not rub it in. And, and this guy, this influencer literally had the balls to literally say to the legions of men on the internet that me as a doctor who was trained in hormone replacement therapy was making up her experience. Oh God. And I was like, I don't make things up. Like I have, I'm very much about direct experience and I'm definitely not lying about this, but 
I have actually prescribed women in my practice who had very low testosterone levels, testosterone, and they got their libido back. And, and so you were just for people that are This home. was an accident. So basically you sat on a chair, someone had sat on there before, they had testosterone cream on, it seeped into your skin and you started to get horny yes. over the period of four to eight hours. Yeah. That's amazing. And not only that, but I was so turned on that I was like, oh my God, is this how men experience life? Like, oh. do they have to go through this every day? Ooh. Like, is this what they have to experience going to work? Like. And I actually changed the way I dressed at work. I, I, I became far more covered up. Explain. I, because I actually started feeling a lot of empathy for men. I was like, if men have to go around every day feeling like this, I have to feel for them because this is highly distracting. As in feeling like this, this is in always on. Horny. Like if I got, if I felt that way every day and I was around women and I was like seeing beautiful women and I was like turned on by, the, by their appearance, I just would feel like, how would I get my work done? <laughs> like, You'd I would, be very distracted. I had to sit in the corner that day and type and not look at anybody. I was like, I did not want to pay attention to anyone. Now, here's the reality. I was not normal to begin with. I have a higher sex drive than an average woman. So the, re the what really was probably happening for me was I already have a high sex drive. Now you give, now you're pouring steroids onto a woman who has a high sex drive. She's gonna have, my sex drive was too much that day. Mm. And, cause I, I don't have sexual dysfunction with my, my desire. I have plenty of desire, it's fine. I'm very spontaneously aroused. Most women are, are actually uh, receptively aroused, which is something that most people don't know. Can you explain that? Yeah, so like I even didn't realize this until maybe three years ago when I, I saw this amazing sex educator to give a talk. And she was like, a lot of women, sit, she's like the majority of women sitting in this audience are actually not going to be aroused just by, just by thinking about sex. They have to be turned on. They have to actually like, Sometimes I'm not even thinking about sex and I can be aroused. Like it can just happen. Like even just I get turned on about life or something. Like really turned on about an idea, you know? Like learning, I'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe I figured this thing out. And I'm just like, and I just get turned on. But like not every woman is like this. So a lot of women need a lot of foreplay. They need a lot of, they, they need to be receptively aroused. Mm -hmm. so they need to have stimulation to get there. And it's just not their programming. And that's okay, but it makes it challenging for a lot of women to keep up with their, their husbands or their partners' sex, sex drives, especially because women have a lot of, you know, like a lot of work on their plate, a lot of stress on their plate, raising children, um, having, you know, being, being the CEO of a company it can be really stressful on the nervous system. And if a woman has, a woman has too much stress in her life, their body, her body will prioritize survival over, over reproduction. So like her body will literally start turning down her sex hormones and start turning up her stress hormones and literally her body will be like I'm just not turned on and so one of the best things you can do to improve your sex drive is to deal with your stress levels but that's really hard in a world that's kind of chaotic right now you know mm -hmm. and like it's just interesting because you know we don't really understand what it's like to be in the opposite sex's shoes I don't think a lot of men really know what it's like to be in a woman's shoes mm -hmm. and what it's like for a woman to like not have that ability to be just turned on all the time because we don't have not every woman has that amount of testosterone running through them and I've met young women in their 20s who had sexual dysfunction because of hormone disruption likely from the environment I mean there are hormone disruptors everywhere there are PFAS chemicals there are all sorts of things in our water supply that shouldn't be there and I'm seeing sexual dysfunction and hormone dysfunction at younger and younger ages. And so it's like, we need to accept that this is like part of existence and also measure this stuff, like get tested. If you have no libido, go to your doctor, get your testosterone checked, get your free testosterone checked. Mm -hmm. Like your sex drive is dependent on your estrogen and testosterone. And if you don't understand, if you don't understand what those levels are and get the right tests taken, which I love the Dutch test by Precision Hormones. Uh, I love cycle mapping tests. Which is, what's the Dutch, Dutch test? Dutch test is like a urine hormone test. And so it's a bit, to me, I think I find it to be a little bit more accurate than just the, the spot tests for, for blood testing. Even though we use blood tests to dose hormones when I was trained, I really like the, um, I really like the, the urine hormone test a little bit more because it's a bit more personalized and nuanced. Mm -hmm. Gives you a lot more metabolites of hormone metabolism. So you just get a broader picture, but it's really a functional medicine doctor or a naturopath you wanna go find this test through. So if you're in a relationship right now and you're not feeling that sexual desire and you know, part of you almost like, if when you, again, going back to the feeling thing, when you don't feel the sexual desire, you don't necessarily feel like you want to explore having sexual you're desire. Just like not as, yeah, you're just like, well, I don't wanna do this, you know? Why? And it can be a real challenge for women, you know, but one of the best things you can do if you've already already ironed out Okay, I don't have hormone dysfunction Then you know exploring your fantasies like we don't get a lot of permission to be like What do I really what turns me on? You know mm. a lot of women just like don't think about that, you know women are very 
by by nature, like this is definitely a massive over overgeneralization. But if you really want to win a woman over, you want to it, it, approach her through, an, through her through her emotions, you know, not just her physiology, because it, it, she she could be totally aroused and actually have no um, desire to have sex, which is fascinating. Mm. So there's so desire is largely like your emotional arousal. And your physical arousal and your wetness is your phys physical manifestation of your arousal, right? So we forget that. Like di desire and arousal is actually lumped together in the same condition called hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It covers desire and arousal disorders. Mm. But what's fascinating is there, there's actually, Emily Nagoski has a great um, TED talk about unwanted sexual arousal and how women who are experiencing um, potentially mm. sexual trauma can get aroused and actually even orgasm. And, and that people... People prosecutors have brought this up in, in, um, in trials. Well, the woman had an orgasm. Well, the woman was turned on. He said so, and it's like, oh my god, like that's not how this works. Like, you know, it's it's crazy because um, we immediately think that if you have the same, if you have the physical manifestation of being turned on, that means that you want it. Mm. But it really is, and the opposite, and the right? Opposite. If you don't have, if you're if you're with your partner and let's say you're dry or it's painful, yeah. it's like, oh my god, like there's something wrong with you, or you yeah. don't want to have sex with me. That's the well, perception. Well, oftentimes, what the biggest problem is is that they're rushing into sex without actually getting her properly aroused. Mm. So there's a this is a really big problem with with sexuality and the difference between men and women is men tend to want to just men really approach often they 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 I have an erection, it's time to have sex. Mm -hmm. But they don't realize that if a woman is not physically aroused that she needs some time to be turned on. And that's what I mean by receptive arousal. You know, rece receptive you know desire. It's like she needs to be desiring it emotionally and desiring it physically, and then she's ready to open herself up. What's the happening with all of that and then the trust piece as well? Huge. Because, I'm just gonna share a little personal yeah. story. Um, I was with a guy for like three, almost four years before Tom. Never once had an orgasm. Mm -hmm. I meet Tom. Every He's time. Amazing. <laughs> He's amazing. I trusted him. He was generous. Yeah. He was chivalrous. He yeah. was kind. Yeah. And multiple, multiple, multiple. Yeah. And I'm like, it does exist. Yeah. But I actually thought women were fibbing. I was like, there's no way. How, how the hell do you have one orgasm, let alone multiple in one session? It didn't make sense. But as soon as I started to feel relaxed, trust yep. him. Oh. Yeah. So what's happening in our brain and our body that when you have this trust element, it allows you to kind of yeah. let go. Okay. So the sexual response requires both stimulate, stimulatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So you need serotonin because that's the inhibitory break. And then you need dopamine, which is the gas pedal. Mm. So it's this interplay between the, ga the break and the gas pedal that can enable you to reach higher and higher states of pleasure and then reach orgasm. What, what, what I've learned is that um, as someone who has experienced sexual trauma, when I was in my 20s, I was unable to be able to relax into sex because my nervous system had been programmed, and this is all polyvagal theory, which is by Stephen Porges' work. I highly recommend reading about it. He basically answered a big question I had, which was, why is it that some women freeze up during sex and can't let go? And if you, it doesn't have to always be like overt rape, but this can even happen with women who just, regularly experience sex with partners who they rush into it over and over again and they just mm. and they don't really they don't prepare um that can actually cause tension in the pelvic or in the pelvic floor and it can basically it's like your brain's like well i, I want sex but your body's like something's not happening and it, there can be a disconnect for women with any form of trauma or something that feels traumatic or feels pressured or feels overwhelming is that their nervous system says this doesn't feel safe and if your nervous system doesn't feel safe, why would it let you reproduce? It doesn't want you to. It wants you to get out of danger. But, the, but here's, the, here's the challenge. There's the ventral part of the nervous system, which is the, the feeling of, of safety. And then there's, the, um, there's also this thing called the fawning response, which is when you pretend to feel okay with someone because you don't feel safe and you can't get away. But then there's the, um, the, the dorsal vagal, which is the... Um, part of the nervous system that if you can't get away from danger, will freeze. Mm. And this is why women who have a history of trauma often get a chance of being, they have, often have a higher rate of re-traumatization. There's a much greater chance of getting um, assaulted again. And that's because their nervous system, if they get put into a, system, a situation where they are being assaulted, they will freeze up and they will be like a deer in headlights and they can't move. And their nervous system's protecting them 
by trying to play dead. Crazy, right? Wow. Wow. I mean, this is something every woman should know, especially the fact that one in four women are abused as children, one in three are assaulted, and one in five are raped. And if, if that's the case, then like, there's a lot of women out there like me who had sexual, who have sexual, had or have uh, had sexual dysfunction, and it's not your fault. Like you had a traumatic experience, your nervous system's trying to protect you, and that's why you're not having pleasure during sex. Mm -hmm. And it took me many, many years of um, bad sex to basically find an answer, which was I, I accidentally healed myself with MDMA with a partner. Before I became a doctor, I was experimenting with a partner and I went from having three different sexual dysfunctions to having none. And that's part of the reason why I started my company because I was like, there's no medicine for sexual trauma really, except for SSRIs, which by the way, causes sexual dysfunction. You know, like they give you SSRI. I have never taken what is SSRIs. SSRI? Uh, antidepressants. Mm. So typically when you hear about women who have had sexual trauma and have, you know, the consequences of it, you know, they, they give, if they, I didn't have, I wouldn't say I, I had clinical depression or anxiety, but I definitely had um, sexual dysfunction. And a lot of women do end up with mood disorders and doctors do give them SSRIs mm -hmm. for trauma-based conditions. And SSRIs cause sexual dysfunction. It is it's technically an anti-love drug. It's not gonna actually allow you to have good sex. It's gonna inhibit your sexual response. So we don't really have good medicine. Mm -hmm. And the number one cause of, sex, uh, of PTSD in this country is sexual trauma. So it's really a big issue, and I know there's a lot of women listening, and we need to destigmatize this, we need to drop all shame around this topic, and we need to come together and like help find solutions, because women deserve to have just as much pleasure as men. God, you know? oh my God. When you're in these moments, and you aren't, you, you, let's say sex is painful, or you're, yeah. you're not sexually aroused, and if you're, you know, the truth about the fact that there was like, that's the most, uh, what, how did you re repeat that? Like, it's the most trauma, is the sexual Oh, trauma? sexual trauma is the number one cause of PTSD. Okay, so. And oh by my... the way, in the military, 70% of women in the military who report anonymously their, their experiences report sexual trauma. Oh God. It's like 40% of like, people who are not anonymized, but it's a lot of people in the military. It's a lot of women. And I'm particularly interested in running studies on this population because it's it, it causes so much disease, is sexual trauma. And it's like so preventable. But yet we don't I mean, this is really the downside of sex, is like you can be you can you risk getting traumatized, you know? And it's not everybody and not every man is bad. I mean, we definitely don't need to treat men like they are they are evil. But there are what I learned about um, you know, I was like studying the evolutionary biology of rape because I was like why do people do this? And I was like, oh, it's literally a mating strategy for lower status men who cannot ha find partners. It literally is In like, tribes, like back yeah, in the day, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I really wanna piece everything together now because this is so damn powerful. Yeah. We started with you saying, like literally, love is just like thirst and hunger. If you don't have it, you're not gonna last long. Yeah. You're not gonna live long. You're not gonna have a thriving life yeah. relationships. Then you said, like, as part of that, the sexual desire is such an important part of um, that connection, that bond. Yeah. But if sexual trauma is one of the highest things that, you know, you just said the stats, it's which one is- one of the biggest causes of sexual dysfunction. That's insane. So now it's like, if we don't address this, it's almost like then you can't really talk about love. Like they really do kind of come yeah. hand in hand or the importance of love and how to get it. Yeah. So I've never freaking heard about that before, that connection, why it's- I mean, look, I studied this for two years because I was like, I'm gonna figure this out. And let me tell you how hard it was to go through the medical literature and have to read paper after paper about how fucked up the world is. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, I mean, there was times, I mean, even when I was reading my book, I was doing my, I, I reported the audio book, and when we got to the section on sexual trauma, like I definitely almost started crying because I was like, it just like, whenever I think about the number of women out there who don't have answers, who don't have support, who don't have help, and who are just, who have terrible sex lives and have struggled with relationships. And it's like, they didn't, des they didn't deserve to be, to be traumatized, you know? And by the way, men too. I've had men in my practice who, there was this one client of mine, he went and did ketamine assisted therapy with um, this company, Field Trip. And I, I kind of encouraged him to go do the therapy. It was sublingual therapy. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I encouraged him is because I had a feeling that he had sexual trauma that he had he, he, he wasn't really addressing. And he was like, it was the, one, of the, one of the risks and the benefits of psychedelics is you can uncover buried trauma. Mm -hmm. But you do need to have a, a support system once the trauma is uncovered because it can really cause a lot of emotional dysregulation. Now, fortunately, he did he did okay, and he was doing he had a support system around him. He had a therapist, 
but it's really important that you do have someone to talk to about your painful experience because that's one of the ways that you can turn down the reactivity of the nervous system. Mm. So I did a trauma training this year called Mind Light, and it's based in Austin. It's a school, a trauma, trauma healing school, really cool school. And one of the things that they taught me was when you're really activated emotionally about something that's triggering you, what you do is you bring up a memory of something that feels deeply safe and comforting. And so I always go to like this place in my, um, my family has a lake house in Wisconsin. And last summer we had like the best family vacation we've ever had. My sister got married, all my nieces were there, everybody got along, nobody fought, and it was like the perfect 10 days. And so whenever I'm feeling activated or, or stressed out about something, I, I, get, I go to my happy place. And I'm able to turn down the valence of the experience to something that's manageable mm. and, and like really not be as triggered by things because I'm able to bring up memories that can induce oxytocin. So what you wanna do is train yourself to bring memories of things that can induce your own natural oxytocin. So feeling compassion, feeling connection, and sitting with animals, like having mm-hmm. hanging out with your friends' dogs, like dogs are a natural source of oxytocin. Um, but like, there's a lot we can, I mean, even just like taking your arm and like just going like this, is a, you can actually release a small amount of oxytocin just by touching your arm softly. Why your arm? It's touch, touch receptors, oh, touch receptors. Oh, because just really anywhere. Yeah, so just... you, like, you know it feels good when someone else does this, yeah. but it actually feels good when you do this too. Mm. So there's these little mini hacks that you can do. But I do think that, um, you know, what I'm optimistic for is that with greater research and greater science, there will be paths for people to heal from their trauma and do so in a way that's safe and, and trusted and, and loving. And like ayahuasca, for example, is a great medicine if you do it with the right, right shaman. And like I always tell people, choose your shaman like you would your neurosurgeon. So like <laughs> don't just have hazardly go sit ayahuasca with someone. Really realize you're doing psychic surgery on yourself. So you wanna be prepared. You wanna do the dieta. You wanna have this person that you trust. You wanna know that shaman, get to know them, get to know their training. Where do they learn? Where do they train? I had a friend who, um, she's a world-class shaman. She trained for years in, in the Amazon with indigenous tribes. Like she lived with them. Mm. That's pretty special, you know? And, and she's someone that when people ask me like, you know, where do I do ayahuasca? You know, I'm like, well, you know, there's only certain places in the world that are legal. So you wanna go to the legal locations and then you wanna go with people that are trained. Mm. Um, but I do think that there is a frontier. There is going to be a world where we will have good trauma medicine. And once we just bring it to the forefront, the reality that like a lot of mental illnesses are rooted in unresolved trauma, and then the nervous system can become hyper hyperactive or hypoactive, right? Mm-hmm. It be, like if you look at a lot of like anger issues or even schizophrenia, this is a very activated bipolar, very active form of, of disorder, right? And then there's things like, you know, certain forms of depression and things like, um, and I guess anxiety would be more hyperactive, right? And then depression and like, people who become, you know, very, very um, isolated and, and withdrawn and social withdrawal, like that's more hypoactivity, right? So sexual dysfunction can, can be a result of, of trauma. You can become hyper, hyperactive, hypersexual, oh, and you can become hyposexual. That makes so much sense. Yeah. So how in those situations, because do, what, do you know any stats about men and how much they've been sexually I think in assaulted. children, it's like one in 11 boys. So it's pretty significant. At least of what we know, what right, we know. that we tell. So yeah. that's almost the point. As you started to break all of that down so beautifully. I, like, I mean, I do know men who've been definitely raped, by the way. That's I've definitely met, multi- I've had boyfriends who've confessed that they were raped by their pre- previous partners. So in that situation, like, did you ask them? Because here's, here's what I'm processing to get to the question, is that women are more open to talking about it. Hopefully, you know, I think that mm-hmm. that's the first step also to, yeah. to acknowledge it and then actually treat it. Yeah. But it is, at least from what I hear, women talk about it. But with the men, if they're not talking about it, are they ever, if they're, if they're not talking about it, if they hide that they've been sexually abused, are they ever able to give over true love to somebody? Or is it you have to actually get to the root unveil that and then work on that connection piece. I mean, that was my path was like, I'd, I'd fix the sexual dysfunction on accident, but I hadn't fixed the attachment issues that had emerged after the trauma. Mm. Um, I didn't fix the relationship to myself that I needed to work on. Mm. So I really love internal family systems, the book, No Bad Parts, like getting to know every version of yourself, mm. whether it's the exiled part that's been traumatized or the firefighter that tried to, tries to put out the fire or numb yourself. Um, or the manager that's trying to keep everything organized. 
And then there's your higher self, which I've done a lot of spiritual work with an amazing therapist who's really taught me to listen to my higher self. And then really getting to know your shadow. What do you mean by your higher self? Your higher so self is like the most courageous, confident, composed, creative. It's really the version of yourself that comes out when you're at your best. Oh, okay. But then there's the shadow side, right? Mm. And your sh I mean, I've done a, quite a lot of shadow work. The thing about the shadow is that when you ignore it and shove it under the rug, it comes out when things get really bad. <laughs> and it's kind of like a dragon that's like in its cave and then you like unleash the dragon and it's like, oh shit. Mm. So you do need to train it. You need to get to know it. You need to acknowledge it. You need to not ignore it. And, um, and you need to be like, and you need to be open about this. Like, hey, when I get triggered, this is how it happens, you know? And also the more that you get to know it, the less that it can affect you, the less that it, the less it shows up because mm. it's acknowledged, it's seen. And 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 really, what it what it's about is finding real deep self love, because when you can love the parts of yourself that you're ashamed about, that you're that you're like you wish weren't part of who you were, but you know they're part of who you are. Everyone has a shadow. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa had a shadow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, turns Zombie out, had a shadow. Everybody <laughs> has a shadow, and so like the reality is, is that. Um, you can let it come out at when you least expect, or you can learn to get to know it and then choose to work on becoming a better person and take in feedback from people when you're not behaving properly and be like, wow, I really got to shift some things in my life. You know, I got to make some changes. I got to, I, I got to repair some, you know, repair some wounds with people. Like that's how you grow into becoming a better person is like you acknowledge the parts of yourself that are challenging and you learn to like become, you, you learn to practice like, okay, like, how do I get into my, how do I really get connected to my higher self? And it's through stillness and meditation and calm and quiet. And it's through listening. And that's hard to do when you're moving a million miles an hour. I mean, when I was most stressed last year was when I had the most conflicts. When I was the most calm this year, it was when everything was smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. And it's like your outer world is a deep reflection of your inner world. And so what I love about, I hate to even use these books because like everyone's like, those are so out of date. But like, I love the books, The Secret and The Law of Attraction, because it's telling the same thing. Yeah. It's the same story. It's that, and this is this is like old school Gnostic wisdom from like ancient times, which is that your inner experience is going to manifest externally. And so like, if you want to change your life, change what's going on inside. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've, I've done a lot of in the last, you know, during the pandemic, it was like, I knew my life needed to change. And so I concertedly worked on it and I made some mistakes and I'm still growing and we're always a work in process. But there's a lot, I mean, internal family systems, attachment work, you know, forgiveness of people that have wronged you, forgiveness of yourself for wronging others. Like there's a lot of things that we can learn from spirituality that don't require religion to practice. Mm -hmm. And that can make you a better person and that can make your life better. Wow, that's, um, I love that you broke that down like that because so many of us, I think we get to your point, we just keep going, going, going. We have these conflicts, we're not quite sure why. And so giving those tactics to calm down, I think really helps you understand yourself, taps inside yeah. and then that obviously leads to incredible relationships. Yeah. I really wanna go back to, if you don't mind, sure. the sexual dysfunction thing. Yeah. Because like, I feel like we're like on the cusp of really freaking like nailing something oh, right know. here. Like if women can listen to what you're saying, acknowledge if they have the dysfunction or not, and then the importance of a female orgasm. Yes. Um, Women don't talk about it enough. And actually I have a quote of yours that really resonated with me that shows I think why it's so important and I think why we're still not there yet as yeah. women and why still in 2023, we're talking about like still being a little like, at least me, being a little coy about talking about orgasms and things like oh, that. Yeah. You said women often grow up with the idea that sex is something you do to please a man. There's not a lot of discussion around female pleasure, especially with younger women. Mm -hmm. This has resulted in generations of women who aren't comfortable acknowledging their sexual needs. Yeah. Why do you think, especially around younger women? Because I heard some sort of like stat where something like 30% of like Gen Z are no longer like, are not interested in sex. I mean, there's certainly a, a, a large percentage Something and good, yeah. and I, I've talked to a lot of Gen Z and they're just like, I was actually talking to some recently and they were like more interested in how they looked during sex on their phone, which is crazy, than their actual experience. Whoa, say that again. They were like, they were like more interested in how they looked during sex Whoa. than they were on the actual experience. So it was very performative. And like, I think that's not uncommon for a lot of people who don't get their needs met and like don't know how to ask for what they want and like see sex on TV and sex on porn and they're like, this is what sex is like. And I guarantee like a lot of women in porn are not having orgasms and they're just like putting on this show. And I mean, the reality is, is that like most 
people these days, most kids these days, are getting most of their education about sex from porn. And the reality is, is that a lot of what porn is teaching women and men is that what turns you on is like the taboo and like mm -hmm. the, yes, of course, power play. Power play is actually one of the bigger causes of arousal. Like when there's a polarity, when there's a little taboo, like role playing, power play, you know, this can be very arousing. But when, when, it, when it gets to the point where it's like, there's, there's like clearly no real connection going on, it's just the sex act, you're missing something really deep about sex. And that's that there's a incredible capacity for like really true transcendent connection with someone if you feel your heart and your mind and your genitals connected to them. Mm. And oftentimes it's just the genitals. And then you feel like, like I, I'm not gonna lie, like I've definitely had sex with people before where I was seeing this guy and I felt like he was using my body to masturbate. Like it oh, felt like, interesting. it felt yeah, like he was using, I felt Ooh. like my body was being used to get off, but he was like not actually interested in my pleasure. Mm. He was like, you're kind of responsible for you. This is on you. Cause I was like, hey, sometimes this hurts. And he was like, well, it's on you. Cause you, you, oh. you, you, you have, you know, I was like, okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, interesting. All right. And I realized that like there was a, there was an emotional disconnection there. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted there to be a connection, but it just wasn't happening because he made me feel like it was my fault that I wasn't getting what my needs were, my needs were met. And I was like, man, this is really challenging. And if it can happen to me and I'm very open and like sex positive and like, I mean, by open, I mean like I'm very much like unafraid to talk about sex. And I'm interested in like, I'm interested in the, in the, in the frontiers of what's possible for sexual pleasure. Because you know it's important? Because I... Or because it just feels I mean, I've great. seen God through <laughs> orgasm. I mean, wow. I've literally had orgasms where I haven't even been touching a guy and I've been able to have a full body orgasm. Like, it, it's wild. And like, I think it's so cool when you feel really connected to someone, what's possible for sex. So I'm mm. just like, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated mm. by like, I'm really fa fascinated by like how our sexuality can return to something that's sacred, something that's really really special and beautiful and sacred and connected to our divinity and I think women have like greater capacity for orgasm than men and yet we are <laughs> we're not getting that regularly <laughs> and as a result um, I, I actually think that if men I think men are I think there is a there are a lot of men in the world that are afraid of the power of female sexuality mm. and I and I think that it's not because it's actually scary but I think it's because it is it, it is an incredibly powerful force right and it's um and I and I think that like it's interesting if you look at the way society has been designed like back in the like back before men and women even knew how babies were made in primitive times there was this theory that I, I actually learned from an, a medical doctor um, that men didn't know how women made babies they just thought women had powers <laughs> they were just like women have powers to make children. I mean, we and did have in, powers. They but... lived in tra they lived in tribes, and they, they didn't have science at the time, so they didn't really know that sperm mm -hmm. caused a baby. Mm -hmm. But then there, the, the, there was a thought that when men realized that women made children from their sperm, that they were like, oh, so that's my child, and so that's my partner, and that means I only provide for them, and it was actually potentially the wow. beginning of the patriarchy. And, and actually, Whoa. if you look at Hammur Hammurabi's code, okay. the earliest recorded writing, it involves a man selling his daughters for, for you know, they were part of his property. And so, like, women and children were technically property before, you know, like, civil rights, like, female and women's rights, you know, before women's rights. Like, before civil rights, people were, slavery was a thing, mm -hmm. right? And before women's rights, like, women were generally property. And that was like part of um, human prehistory. So we've got a lot of work to do as a, as like to, I mean, I'm very much about e egalitarianism. I'm like, we, the world would be better if men and women had equality. I just really firmly believe this. And I think that men would actually have, I mean, the men that I know that recognize the power of a woman's, woman's pleasure and really put her pleasure first, they get more pleasure. They do, they tell me that. They're like, I have way oh, better 100%. sex when she's getting off. And um, it's funny because I, I just find that I think a lot of men have insecurity around not knowing a woman's body, not knowing how she works, not knowing how to really please her. And so they, they, will, they will blame the woman for her own dysfunction when really it's their own insecurity that's really speaking. Oh, 
Oh, I was literally going to ask as well because you hear, you know, the guy that's just like, I don't care. So I'm, I'm probably going to get attacked by all the bros, by the way, for this. No, but here's, like, but here's the thing. <laughs> I'm just re- waiting for so it. So, A, I need to make sure that everyone freaking is. I fucking love men. I do too, by the way. And, and my husband is my biggest damn cheerleader. Yes, and that's so, why you're such a rock star yeah. and why he's such a rock star because you have love that makes you guys more self-actualized. Right, and that's the point. Is that To me, this isn't even a man-woman thing. This is more of like a couple thing and how typically some men respond and typically how some women respond because I think you need to address it, right? Because in yeah. order for us to actually make change, for people to actually connect, to find love, to find that, that, that person that they really want to be with, this is so damn important. So I'm not actually even like saying this all to make a guy feel Feel bad like I th- I actually hope they're like yes I now yeah. know right like that's the hope is that they receive your message with their arms wide open because you're literally giving them the gift like yeah. in all honesty you're giving them the gift to make a woman have now more, multiple or- orgasms well I mean let's get back to the As connection the piece right like the orgasm is one thing but if you if you study transcendent sex there's a book on it it's literally called transcendent sex they did a survey and they they, they interviewed a bunch of people who claim to have amazing transcendent sex and like what well, what 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 is this all have in common mm-hmm. and the and it actually wasn't the number of orgasms it was that they were they all commented that they had great orgasms but they're like but that wasn't the thing that made it transcendent what made it transcendent was the ability to feel completely connected to someone else mm-hmm. to have your boundaries dissolve oh, yeah. to have this sense of just it was almost like they described sex as a psychedelic experience like a lot of the ways that they did, you describe a psychedelic experience that's what they felt like. And it was about the level of emotional and physical connection with this other person that made it profound. It, it, and it was like, it wasn't even about our bodies. It was about the level of feeling connected to this human being and feeling like I could completely let go into their arms. Mm-hmm. And how do you get there? Well, of course, having great sexual skills is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I've had some amazing partners with great skills, but really the best sex is connected sex. It's where your mind is connected to them, where your heart is connected to them, your 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 genitals are connected to them, but you're spiritually in and you you just feel like there is something greater happening here than just the physical connection of your bodies. Mm-hmm. And what's what what pains me is that there's this whole legion of men in the world that are not having sex and they're angry. And they're very very they're online and they're angry and they're complaining. And they're like they and there's this kind of pervasive attitude in this in this like legion of men that's like they're mad at women and they're like you should just be wanting to have sex with me and it's like no you're fighting biology no like we don't want to have sex with you because you are mean and you're (laughs) upset and that's not that's not sexy What's sexy is when i feel connected to you Mm. and i feel loved by you and i feel seen by you Mm. and the sad thing is is i think that a a lot of the reasons why they are in that state of anger is because like men in isolation do not produce lots of oxytocin. Mm. They get more vasopressin. They get men are vasopressin dominant and vasopressin is about aggression. And I think that the sad thing about men who are not having good sex too, by the way, because I actually think that there is a problem of a lot of men who, who don't have, who are not, not gonna find partners. And there's and like there's this re- research on dating apps where like small percentage of men who are highly sought after get most of the dates. And then there's a lot of men who just don't. Like that Mm -hmm. sucks, like that's not fair. And like that does lead to a lot of, I can understand why they'd be frustrated. I can understand, like I get, I think if I haven't had sex for a while, I I do sometimes get a little resting bitch face. Like (laughs) I'm gonna be real, like it can can happen. And it's funny because like uh, my friends are like, why don't you just like find, like take a lover? And I'm like, but I want a partner, you know? Like I want to have a partner. I'm not really into promiscuity, it's Mm. not my thing. And it's like, and I'm not against it. I have plenty of friends that are that are into it, and I'm like they're having a blast. But um, but it's funny because like I think what we're all really seeking is we're all seeking that real connection, but we're not taught how to find it. You know, like it's not taught to us in school. And kids are flying blind. They're on their phones all day. They're disconnected. You know, the, what the phone is really giving you is processed social connection. Mm-hmm. It's like processed food. Mm-hmm. It's not really giving you nourishment, right? It's not. It's 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 just not the same. Oh God, I love that. And um, I want to make sure everything you just said, by the way, is literally why is the example of why we love men and why actually I think hopefully men love this episode because you're giving tools. You're not just giving tools to the woman, but you're actually giving tools to the guy because if the woman, if the guy is feeling like their their partner and obviously we're talking heterosexual right now, but like if their partner is like distancing themselves, if they're noticing their partner's more moody, more upset, you know, like more common traits for women, I think you're actually giving them tools in order to bring them closer. Yeah. And to say, like, 
at least for my husband, the first time I had multiple orgasms, it was like he won the championship. Like he was so proud of himself. Exactly. That, it, that to me, it almost like couldn't, I couldn't understand it when you're like, but some guys don't want to blame the woman. Cause I'm like, it was, so wasn't my experience it, it, with it, the guy like, it's usually a sign they're not the one. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, to be honest. Or you know? actually, could it be a sign, though, to going back to what you were saying, like they've had trauma, and so for them, they just perceive it differently? I do wonder that. I really do. But, I mean, having asked previous partners if they've had any history of trauma, like, I've only had, like, maybe one admit it. I was so, going to say, who's going to actually admit know, it right now? It's one, of, one of my exes actually had, um, uh, had children, and one of them was the product of his um, ex, having sex with him while he was passed out after a night drinking in college. And that's, that's right. And like, so this is like, this is happen to men and women. It's another reason why everyone should just give up alcohol, frankly, like alcohol is a carcinogen. Mm. At this point, there's no redeeming benefits to it, really. I'm still gonna maybe have a glass of wine at like a wedding or if like I'm in Napa. But at the end of the day, alcohol is a scourge. It, it causes a lot of dysfunction. It causes a lot of sexual dysfunction. It causes a lot of cancer and it causes a lot of disease. And it also causes a lot of rape. And I don't think I would have had the date rapes I had in college if I had not been drinking. So I think that like, and, and this is, I can say, I can think, I think I can say this without offending people, but I genuinely think that most of us would be better off if we didn't drink a lot. Like, I, I think that alcohol, Why I mean- Why offend people? It's just because like a lot, I have people that just love alcohol. I, I have friends that run alcohol businesses. But that's fine. You know? It's like, look, yeah. to me, it's like, and sorry to interrupt you, but I actually get annoyed when people get offended by you saying things like that, because it's yeah. like, you just tell, like, don't hate the, the message or the knowledge. Well, Huberman did it first. So, I mean, I had, I had a whole lecture on alcohol and its issues with health years before he yeah. came out. And I was like, well, he said it and I can say it. <laughs> but you do worry because there's, it's a huge industry. It's a massive industry. There's a lot of people who want to see people continue to drink. But what I'm you know? saying is like, you do you. Like, I know, it, it, like, I know. The worst thing for me is I didn't realize, right? Like, oh my God, I didn't realize alcohol does this and has this knock on effect. Yeah. But if I realize and I'm like, screw it, I'm gonna drink. Go ham. Like, I, I'm <laughs> never here to tell someone what life to live, but I absolutely am here. Like, I on, you want to hear about my, like, my freaking mission, girl? It's to give people the damn knowledge. Yeah. That's it. Like, whatever they choose to do with the knowledge is yeah. up to them. I'm not that type of person that's yeah. like, you've got to listen to me. I'm like, there it is. Yeah. If, do you want to have a great relationship? Here you go. Do you yeah. want to have great sex? Here you go. Yeah. And now, if you choose not to, I'm, I can sleep well at night knowing that that information has been passed yeah. on and now someone can do whatever they want with it. Oh yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing I learned at Stanford. I was like preparing this course and it was so focused on metabolism, so focused on movement, so fo focused on mastering stress and then an environment and you know pollution and all the things that are typically covered in health class, mm. but really deep. And then I got to the relationship piece and I was like, how did I miss this elephant in the room? Like, how did I miss this thing that was transforming our health and our mental health? And why wasn't this taught to me in medical school? And so I, I started this company, Adama Bioscience, right? And I started it with this like pie in the sky idea. I was like, you know what? If we understood the science of love, I'm sure we could create products and services that could help people love more. And one of the first things we did was create a love drug. And it was like, it's like, man, wouldn't it be great if we could just like return that passionate love in our relationships to like, let's say you're in a long-term relationship and you want to feel what it's like to fall in love again. It's like, wouldn't that be great? I, I met with one investor and he's like, how do you know if you're doing the right thing? And I was like, well, I just really feel like that this could really benefit society. And he's like, well, let me tell you a story about my life. And he's like, you know, he's like, I invested in maps and I invested in MDMA assisted therapy, but I also used MDMA with my partner and we didn't turn out and it was really hard to detach from this person. And it was actually harder for me. And I had to use MDMA to fix the attachment that I had to this person that I had to divorce. And I was like, oh Whoa. shoot. So maybe this isn't always the right thing, you know? And, and the thing is, is that like, I, I mean, MDMA is probably gonna get approved. And I'm a big proponent of MAPS because I think they're a great organization, but I'm also a critic of the psychedelic movement because I'm in it and I'm seeing the best and the worst of it. And like the best part of it is like, if you have PTSD, 68% of people in MAPS trials are getting cured from PTSD. And PTSD can massively affect relationship quality. The biggest cause of PTSD is sexual trauma. Sexual trauma can affect parenting. It can affect your ability to bond. It can affect your attachment style. It can affect a lot of facets of your ability to love. It can affect your relationship to your family, you know? 
But the thing about MDMA is it's a love drug. And so what happens if five to 10% of therapists in the world and psychiatrists in the world have relationships with their clients? And that's without MDMA. Whoa, didn't That's without MDMA. <laughs> so now we're pouring, pouring a love drug into psychiatry. What's gonna happen there, right? How many therapists are gonna fall in love with their clients? How with, you know? Then also, sorry to interrupt, but the thing that you just said that really hit me that I like really wanna hammer home is how many people right now are in love necessarily with someone that isn't healthy for them? But now we're going into a, fee like we're, we're mixing psychedelics with medicine. And there's, and, and, and largely this industry is run by men. I mean, every single, I'd say 99% of the companies in psychedelics are run by men. Mm -hmm. And men are hardworking and they're diligent and they have good intentions, but the world is paved with good intentions and bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm very much like, a I really believe that we need to, we need to examine this movement of psychedelics and we need to realize that like, yes, these could help us. Yes, these could heal relationships. I have a lot of friends who've like said to me, these, these are friends that are like investors as a, as a business. Um, and they're like, um, if it wasn't for psychedelics, I wouldn't be still married and it's saved my marriage. And I know people who've said this, but I also know people who've had sexual trauma under the influence of psychedelics, right? So like, we need to realize these are just like, just like love, love drugs, are risky business. And we need to be careful with how we administer these medicines. We need to have very clear protocols, very, very, very clear um, questionnaires to figure out who are the right candidates for these medicines. And we need to make sure that we don't put these in the wrong hands. Because in the wrong hands, they're gonna hurt people. There's this like idea that like psychedelics are just like ultimately awesome. And like, they, I, I love psychedelics. Like, don't get me wrong, they changed my life. They healed my sexual trauma. They made me a better person. They made me a more open person but they also come with real risks. And so it's important that if you're gonna be out talking about them in society and, and studying them and writing studies on them, that you also really, you, you have to put like, you have to like take off this like rose colored glasses. You have to look at them clearly because like Timothy Leary, when, when he was in the 60s, running around proselytizing about LSD being like the best aphrodisiac of all time, he wasn't necessarily wrong, but he definitely was, um, he wasn't really painting the true picture of these things and the risks of these things. And so there was a lot of people that like just haphazardly took these medicines and got hurt. And I don't want that to be the case for our generation. Mm. You know, there's enough problems in society. We don't need to add more, more to them. Oh my God, okay, dude, this, this is so damn powerful. So for people listening right now, I just want to pause and let people kind of orient them. Yeah. Because this is the first time I've personally really spoken about psychedelics on this show. Yeah. And so I don't want people to dismiss it or you. We don't want like to dismiss it. Or, or, or also like say that they're not, they're not, they don't have potential. Well, but also I think that people think just like if you were brought up in the era of like, you know, say no to marijuana, right? Like people are kind of like, oh, but I don't know, psychedelics, are they good for you? So I just want to orient people in that, like once upon a time when the x-ray machine came out, yeah. people were freaking out where they're like, oh my God, this is so bad for you and blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. you're, you're, you're putting electric, electric waves in your yeah, body. Yeah, totally. So the perception of new technology, new ways of approaching things have always been shunned. Yep. And so what I'm trying to get to is how do we orient the audience and women, especially yes. with what you're saying, because if you, Dr. Molly, are saying, this is freaking important, and this is a piece that people aren't talking about, and I'm just exploring it, but we got to start looking at it. I want to be like, cool, how do we get people on board and then for them to see the potential? Yeah. Because I get the confused mind says no. Oh, sure. So now if people sure. are listening and they're like, well, I don't know, I don't do psychedelics, I'm not a druggie, right? Like there's so yeah. much perception. So if we can just pause and say, everything you laid out about love, the fact that the, the knock on effects, the consequences to not having love in your life, mm -hmm. loneliness, which mm -hmm. we need to talk about, all of this means that it, we have to do something. Yes. Because it's now become its own pandemic, if you will. Exactly. So now knowing, okay, you've just discovered this is just as important as thirst and hunger. What are we gonna do about it? We need, we have broken bones. We figure out the x-ray machine. Right. We need love. Maybe it's psychedelics. Yeah. So, I just wanted to orient people of why I'm so fascinated right. on this. I've never done them before, but I'm fascinated, girl, sure. fascinated. So when I realize this is what it does, this is the opportunity, not to say it's perfect, I don't want people yeah. to run away, but now it's like, let's explore it. Well, just like I was explaining how love has got this positive and negative side to it, like I can do the same thing with psychedelics. So I started studying psychedelics when I was 18. I was in, I mean, before, well before I ever tried them, I was studying them and I was in the history and philosophy library in the University of Illinois. 
And I remember being, I mean, I was a, such a library nerd, but I was very deeply passionate about learning. And I would teach myself a lot of subjects that I didn't take classes on. And there was no class on psychedelics. So I found the section in the library on the history of psychedelics. And I was like, I'm going to take all these books with me, <laughs> checked them all out. And I sat and went through each one of them. And I remember thinking, wow, these things are really vilified. How is it that these things have been treated like so damn taboo and they clearly have been a part of human history and evolution for a long time mm. so really what people really need to start with is an understanding of their historical significance so they were very much a part of pagan pre um pre-monotheism polytheistic religions so religions where women were priestesses where there was worship of nature worship mm. of sexuality worship of the home worship of, of femininity and there were Eleusinian mysteries. There were sacred mystery schools that were that, that basically administered um, psychedelic brews. One the most famous one was called the Kikion. And people used these in ceremonial sacred contexts. And they were part of community gatherings. They were part of religious rituals. And then Christianity comes along and the Inquisition comes along and women start getting burned at the stake as witches. And the no Christian Gnostics kind of like were they, they they definitely it's thought according to the immortality code that people were having these ceremonies underground because they were starting to get persecuted and essentially like women would prepare these psychedelic brews people would come together they would drink them and they would connect and that was part of their rituals mm -hmm. right and now we have modern days right we have like this modern world and people go to burning man and people have these rituals, and people have, it's almost like our modern Eleusinian Il mystery. Oh my God, never thought of it like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it is really, to me, I mean, it's got an effigy, it's got, you know, it's it's got its own sort of religiosity to it. I mean, people return every year, and it's a big part of their experience, a big part of their culture. Um, so I think that psychedelics kind of co-evolved with humanity and potentially helped enhance our capacity to, to connect. Mm. And I think that if you look at a lot of indigenous cultures and the way that they use psychedelics, they're very much a part of, um, you know, rites of passage. They're parts. They're 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 they're, they're like in in um, the Buiti tribe, you know, they give young men ibogaine as part of their rite of passage of becoming a man. Mm. And a hero's so, journey, right? It's a hero's. It's part of the hero's journey. Mm. And so I think, at least for me, when I first tried mushrooms in my early twenties, um, before I was a doctor, I. I remember being speechless. I mean, I would, I would, it was, it was literally the mystical experience was so profound that I felt like it was, the definition was ineffable. There was no, there was no way to describe it. I, I was just completely flabbergasted at its profundity. Um, and I didn't touch them for many, many years mm -hmm. because I didn't feel the need to. I felt like I had gotten the message, you know? Um, now we're living in a world where in LA, I mean, you can get mushroom chocolate pretty much anywhere. <laughs> and um, people are kind of using it to replace alcohol. And there's definitely an underground movement of psychedelic medicine um, in practitioners' offices. There's certainly a lot of doctors using, using ketamine-assisted therapy. Um, ketamine is a legal psychedelic, you know? It's something that is being used for PTSD and anxiety, depression. Um, it's one of the only drugs we have to abort suicide which is really surprising. Wow. So like people who are about to kill themselves like can take ketamine therapy and basically find that they no longer want to die, which is like pretty special. I mean, we do need medicine for people who are about to go because there's going to be a lot more diseases of despair as we overcome a lot of infectious diseases. So um, ketamine has risks. I mean, there's ketamine use disorder. I know plenty of people who have ketamine problems. And you know what? Like. The street ketamine is often cut with all sorts of garbage and I, you know, it's danger. It can be dangerous to take these medicines if you get them on the street. So they are risky. They can cause um, psychological addiction. Psychedelics are generally not addictive substances, but they can become habituating and people become, you know, people, people start using them over and over again and they have a hard time stopping. Mm -hmm. um, ketamine has real risks to the body. It can cause bladder dysfunction. It can cause kidney dysfunction. Um, it can cause sexual dysfunction if used chronically. So like, is it, but, but yet there's doctors that are, and there's therapists that are using it with couples to help them work through problems. They're actually using, even in California today, even, even in Beverly Hills, you can find a doctor that does ketamine assisted couples therapy. I mean, this is wow. coming. So, you know, then there's things like psilocybin, right? So it's psychedelic mushrooms grow on, um, you know, cow manure and you can find them in almost anywhere. 
just naturally growing, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> so, you know, Terrence McKenna thought that we co-evolved with mushrooms and it helped us enhance our evolution. But what's interesting about mushrooms is being studied by Compass Pathways as a medicine for treatment-resistant depression. And they're getting pretty good research out of it. And there's actually places in, in Jamaica, and there's even an article in The Cut last week about how mushrooms might be one of the newer treatments for eating disorders. And I've seen people who were suicide, suicidal never think about suicide again. I've seen people who were fully anorexic completely recover from anorexia. Now, does that mean mushrooms are perfectly safe? Um, if you overdose on mushrooms, you can have a psychotic breakdown. Like, it, it can be really dangerous if you overdo mushrooms. Like, if you have a family history of psychosis. I had a friend who had a family history of psychosis. He tried mushrooms. I said, don't do it, and he did it anyway. He was like, I was like borderline psychotic. And I was like, I told you not to try them, dude. Like, you're not mm. the right candidate. And that's one of the, that's the thing. Like, they can, they can lead to change in your personality for, in the positive. Like, you can literally go from being highly neurotic to like an open person. That's crazy. So like, if you don't want to change your life or your personality, you like probably shouldn't experiment with these things. Mm. But if you do find yourself closed, closed minded and more neurotic and you want to find more openness, you know, let, like there are places in the world, um, Colombia, Brazil, um, Jamaica, or Amsterdam, where mushrooms are legal. So does that mean that you should just go off and take them? Definitely not. I mean, ever, I've heard so many horror stories of people who go to Amsterdam and eat a bunch of truffles and end up having a terrible trip. So like, not recommended. Yeah. But in a context where you have trained facilitators, trained doctors, trained psychologists who do this for a living, it's a different experience. If you look at Colorado, Oregon, parts of Michigan, even maybe even DC, New York, there's a decriminalization movement happening. And I was in Oakland when marijuana was de being decriminalized. Mm -hmm. And I remember moving there and I was like, oh my God, I'm in another world. There is marijuana shops on the streets. What is this about? <laughs> like, what is happening? Do you smoke weed? I don't really, but Ooh. like, I have a friend who has a company called 1906 and I've tried his um, edibles mm. and he's got these microdoses. And I have to say, they're like, they're, they're a mix of microdoses and, um, and like herbs. And they're very, very, very tiny amounts, like 2.5 milligrams. So I guess like, so I don't really, I don't really smoke weed, but I will occasionally have one of these edibles. It's actually one of the more, one of the better aphrodisiacs that exists. Um, but what I love is that like, there's now companies like his that are, make it available to like not get super high. You know, you can have mm -hmm. tiny, tiny bit of marijuana and have this like wonderful experience with your partner. Um, heavy, heavy marijuana use and heavy smoking marijuana. It turns out that like smoking marijuana Everyone said it was so safe for your lungs. Uh-uh, not true. It's just like, it's like just as risky they saying now as smoking. So it's like, it's, it's combustion. Mm. So you probably shouldn't smoke weed if you want to protect your lungs. Um, but, uh, in, but like these, these edibles are like getting really sophisticated. And, um, they're, and they're like very precisely dosed. Like when marijuana first started coming out, the dosing was all over the place. People had no idea what they were taking. They would take a single gummy bear and end up high for two days. Like, it was nuts. And now, the same thing's happening in psilocybin. So you're seeing these decriminalized zones, these companies coming out with psilocybin, and, um, and the dosing is all over the place. Mm. And people are putting it into the fridge. Their aunts are taking it. Their kids who are visiting, or like their, their friends' kids who are visiting are taking it. And now they've got people who are high in their house and then like maybe have to go to the hospital because they're freaking out. So like there's the same, I'm watching the same thing happen with the psychedelic movement of like psilocybin where it first it starts out as a medicinal legalization path through these decriminalized zones. Then these companies come out with recreational products. There's even a company called Recreation out there in Austin. And, um, and then before you know it, the industry sh starts to get regulated, starts to get um, properly test there starts to be proper proper testing and then before you know it in 10 years there's like going to be companies that have very precise administration of experiences it'll be just like marijuana it'll be in certain cities it'll be federally illegal to transport it unless biden decides he's going to decriminalize these things and like make them reschedule them but there's probably going to be a, a change in our lifetime around psychedelics and our approach to them and we'll probably see a similar movement around marijuana I, I just think it's coming. And there will also be companies that will get things approved, like CBD and Epidiolex mm. for um, seizures. You know, CBD is a really cool medicine because it actually increases oxytocin, which I didn't know. And I was like, wow, that's part of the reason why I feel so good to take CBD. 
And CBD is in marijuana, right? It's in, it's in hemp, hemp, hemp and, yeah. and marijuana, but typically the stuff that people are taking is derived from hemp most most days. Um, but CBD is a really potent medicine, and it's a prescription medicine now for a seizure disorder, and it's very expensive. But like, we'll see these dual markets, we'll see the prescription world, we'll see the recreational world, and we'll see things get tightened up with dosing and a lot, a lot more regulated. And, and it'll be, I think it'll be better for the world. And I don't think it's gonna be a free for all. I think it's gonna be, I think our country knows what it's doing now with marijuana, mm. that it, it'll probably be similar, but it's gonna take some time. So I love marijuana. Um, my husband doesn't. Yeah. And when I met him, being from Europe, it was just like everyone kind of did it. Yeah. No, I'm gonna hate, get hate messages now in the comments about Europe. Yeah. But no, so when I met my husband, like I was actually really shocked. You don't smoke like everyone I know did. Yeah. So then like, 10 years into our relationship yeah. he was like you know i'm gonna try it we had like the most incredible sex it yeah. was like so bizarre because he his because he wasn't used to it yeah. his sensations he was so heightened yeah so he's like oh my god touch is amazing right so he was having this like really interesting experience yeah. and as the partner i was because he was narrating so i was actually laughing because i'm like you realize you're narrating every single thing and he's yeah. like no, no it's fascinating but I felt like I was actually connecting with him more because we were kind of going on this journey together. Now, I'm never just going to say like, people should take drugs to experience the thing together. Yeah. But it becomes this like moment of connection. Mm. Um, and because we de definitely did it in a safe way, it was like really beautiful. Yeah. And so I think like anything, there's you do too much of it it's going to be detrimental but the right amount and it's magic it could be magic exactly yeah. now again i want people at home to i i haven't i haven't tried psilocybin i haven't tried psychedelics yet mm -hmm. but i'm extremely fascinated yeah and so where can people right now go because there's is a, there's a lot of complexity to it sure. right like you live in the world and even now they're still not sure about certain doses and things yeah. like that if people are interested just to follow along i'm going to keep bringing you on by the way oh, because i sure. want i want to keep like people up to date on yeah. like what you're doing and all the the psychedelics and like what we should try and maybe next time we'll try something i'll come up i mean there's a bunch of things that i love for i mean i've been digging into everything you can do for sexual enhancement okay so people just want to be like look i'm a newbie everything yeah. you're saying because we i think we've done a good, pretty good job oh, for of, sure like connecting the love and then the sex and yeah. the emotions and how to handle things so now if they just want to keep following what's sure. like a good resource that they can go to well i mean the best place to find me is personally drmolly.co on instagram and, and my website um, we're doing a big rebrand for Adama Bioscience and I'm nice. really excited because a lot of what we're going to do this year is we're launching a, a new sex therapy and we're also going to be launching it with different medicines that are going to be available to help enhance your sexual function. So there's a peptide that we're going to be working with another company to launch. There's um, some brand collaborations with cannabis companies we're going to build. Um, and like essentially like what I'm realizing is like we don't have to be the best at everything, but we can help insert our science into collaborations mm. with companies and products. And then obviously, like as psilocybin co gets gets commercial, gets um, legalized, we're gonna work with companies in Oregon and Colorado to develop our own formulas that are for those markets. And then MDMA is getting a, potentially gonna get approved by MAPS. And we've already spoken to MAPS about being an integration program, being a, a therapeutic intervention that could be used as like the therapeutic experience that people get for integrating their MDMA experiences. So we've got a lot of things we wanna build over the next few years, but what we're really aiming to do is find a new way to solve sexual dysfunction for as many women as possible by building out a really comprehensive program for identifying if you have dysfunction and then identifying if you have issues in your romantic life or your attachment and then giving you um, information on how to prepare yourself for having improved sex, how to actually enhance the act of sex through new techniques, and then how to integrate your experience with you and your partner so that you can actually solidify the learnings that you're getting into your into your life so you can actually have better and better sex. Dude, this is huge. Yeah. This could like change the face of well, sexual design. Sex therapy you... hasn't been innovated in like 50 years. Oh my God. And it almost only deals with the psycho psychological aspects, mm. which is important. But also like there's phys there's physical facets of sex that I think people want to learn how to, I mean, I, I have sometimes have sex when it's painful. And I'm like, I want to have painless sex. Like, you know what the number one factor women say that makes great sex is it doesn't hurt? 
Oh God! I mean, come on! Is that literally? The, oh. Is that literally all we got? Oh. You know? And I, I, I want people to be able to have like transcendent experiences. Mm. But you may not want. I mean, there's there's CBD lubes from company like Foria. There's Delta Eight lubes from companies like Kush Queen. There's different um, microdose um, marijuana products from companies like 1906. Um, you know, there's some really cool stuff out there and, and we, what we want to do is build our co-branded product line with other companies that are going to be able to do fulfillment for us and like do, do co-marketing. Damn God, that's amazing. Thank you. So say, if you don't mind where people can find you. Um, drmolly.co, D-R-M-O-L-L-Y. Dr. Co. Molly. I mean, my, my friend Eamon <laughs> coined it and I'm like, it's so obvious, but it's funny because like, you know, I, I definitely feel like. I spent the last 10 years really focused on food and metabolism. But the biological imperative is about survival through gathering resources, but also connection mm -hmm. through our sex sexuality, through our love, through our relationships. And so like, I'm at the end of the day, just I really care about like, how do you create a healthy, flourishing human? And then what are the biggest things that create problems in that space? So how do we really address the things under the surface that are causing the most despair and suffering and how do we alleviate those? And that's that's why I think food and sexuality are like the two fun, fun places to work in. Oh my God, God, thank you so much. We literally didn't get even past the sexuality part of the book for the spark There's factor. so much to talk about. So much to talk about. Guys, guys, you've got to go check out her book. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if this episode brought you value, guys, please do drop in the comments. What was the one piece of gold she spilled? I have so many, I actually can't choose one, but I'd love to hear from you guys. So drop it in the comments. If you're not subscribed, guys, please, please do click that subscribe button and tell your homies about this show. We've got to spread the word around the world about women of impact and until next time guys be the hero of your own life get the spark factor peace click here right now guys if you want to learn the five taboo tricks you need to try right now to have mind-blowing sex only 20 percent of women will orgasm with a penis so i'm going to do a heterosexual relationship man woman penis goes in vagina the way we've been brought up